Welcome to our Kamalaya Conversation. It's really wonderful to have you here. And we have been doing at Kamalaya because we believe that all life is interconnected. We think that along with our programs, part of the things that we like to do is bring wonderful people like yourselves who are making a difference in the world, trying to do something that makes a difference in the world, and create a conversation in kind of a relaxed atmosphere and bring it out to a larger audience. So with that, I'd like to introduce you Professor Mark Huntley, professor at uh, University of Hawaii, Hilo, and also a visiting uh, scholar at Cornell University. And I know that you've spent your life working on how to solve climate change within an actual generation, mm -hmm. which is absolutely fascinating because there's so much negative news about climate change and you've actually are developing a doable positive message. Maybe to start the conversation, you could give us just a short um, introduction into where we are at the moment and then what you would like to do about it. Well, where we are at the moment is we're emitting 50 billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere every year. And about 75% of that comes directly from fossil fuels. And we have to start turning that around. And there are two things we can do. We can uh, begin replacing fossil fuels with renewable energy sources and secondly we can suck CO2 out of the atmosphere um, and what I've been looking at is ways in which we can do that in a short time frame ways that are technically and economically feasible and perhaps now you'd like to tell us about algae how did you get into algae what did you find out about algae and I know you had huge projects with algae and you developed ways to grow it and uh, I think it's very exciting and everybody wants to know. Okay. Well, I got into algae basically because uh, I was a copepatologist. <laughs> copepatologist? Um, I studied marine copepods. Marine copepods are microcrustaceans and they eat algae. So I had to grow algae to feed my copepods. That's how I got into algae to begin <laughs> with. <clears throat> but um, I soon realized- it Sounds like was, a nightclub, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, at the same time, this was in the, in the late 80s, climate change was just getting on the radar and I became part of a global international geosphere biosphere program, <clears throat> which was studying the effects of climate change on marine ecosystems. In fact, it was the only component of that program studying <clears throat> the effect of marine, uh, effect of climate change on marine ecosystems. And I began to realize that uh, I did not just want to document the path to destruction, but I wanted to do something about it. And I realized that these little algae that I was growing uh, had the capacity. I mean, they're the fastest growing photosynthetic organisms on the planet. To give you an idea, uh, we talk about their growth rates in terms of doublings per day. Doubling Imagine, per day. Doublings per day. Imagine if your front lawn was doubling every day. You'd spend your whole <laughs> life mowing it. You'd, spend, you'd be mowing it every day. Yeah. And that's exactly what you do when, when you're producing algae. You're harvesting them every single day, 365 days a year. Is this a good moment to tell, to say that algae are part of the original life forms on Earth that led to creating oxygen, that led to creating mammal life because they created the food source yeah, the, the first photo, the, well, the first photosynthetic organisms on, uh, on the planet were cyanobacteria, which are photosynthetic organisms that are related to algae. <clears throat> and those came along about three and a half billion years ago, a long time ago. And they generated the oxygen that made life possible for all of us animals. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's really incredible. When you think about that, that's really quite incredible. And you told me something else that I found absolutely extraordinary, is that all omega-3 oils come from algae. All omega-3 fatty acids. Which are absolutely <clears throat> essential which are for human life. Essential for nutrition. Those come inevitably from algae. The algae are the only source. You may get them in fish oil, but you get them in fish oil because fish ate copepods, which ate the algae or fish ate the algae, but that's how they get it. It gets 
transferred up the food chain. All my life I've been told you can't be a vegetarian because you have to eat fish or you can't get the omega-3 oils. But actually what you're saying is omega-3 oils don't even come, they come from fish as a byproduct uh, right. because of, they ate the algae. Right. We could also eat the algae. Yeah, and, and that's a tremendously profitable business right now and uh, obviously growing. Maybe we could go straight into why is algae the solution to the problem that we're facing? Okay, let's go back to the total emissions. Well, electricity is responsible for 30% of emissions. <clears throat> and if we now create renewable fuels, renewable energy, we've gotten rid of 30% of the emissions. Two big sources still exist for emissions. One is transport fuels, that's about 20%. And the second one is heat, industrial and, and local residential heat. And that's also responsible for about 20%. So 20% of the global emissions are because we heat our houses and because factories need heat to produce their products. Right. Okay. And, 20 and the, another 20% responsible for all the fuels that we use to push ourselves around the planet. And if you want to consider it on a very personal level, every year, on average, you, me, we're responsible for emitting 7,000 kilos of CO2 into the atmosphere. Each one, each human being, each human seven being, and a half billion people. Seven and a half eight. billion people, each emitting 7,000 kilos. Wow. You know, it's just, it's <clears throat> just to imagine, to think what that really means in terms of how much excess it takes for us to live the, the lives, even what we think are simple lives. Yeah. yeah. We are yeah. producing so much excess. So back to the um, now getting rid of the emissions from transport fuels and heat. This is a role, this is an area where algae play a role. Microalgae for making um, replacements for transport fuels and macroalgae or seaweed kelp for making the replacements to heat. Let's take the transport fuels first. Right now, we have biofuels available from crops such as corn, uh, sugarcane, those make ethanol, and soybeans and palm oil, which make biodiesel. Uh, those crops uh, make all of, all of the biofuels that we currently produce. Now, if we say that half of the cars are, or half of the use of fuels is going to be from electricity, right? So that if we say all light duty cars and trucks are going to go electric, we still need the fuels for rail, for ships, for aircraft, <clears throat> and for large trucks. So that leaves us with a substantial amount of fuel that we need to produce. If we produce those all from, let's say, palm oil, that would mean we'd essentially have to deforest all of Southeast Asia and we'd use uh, something like three times more potassium than the world has. So palm oil is not an option. <clears throat> um, on soybeans, we need an area the size of Brazil and Russia to be deforested. And that deforestation from those traditional biofuel crops would lead to more emissions, more the deforestation causes CO2 emissions, and we end up with more emissions than we get from diesel fuel. So you tear your hair out. You think, this is the end. We can't do it. We, there's no way to produce biofuels. So microalgae to the rescue. The first thing is microalgae. We're talking about marine microalgae. So those grow using seawater. Mm -hmm. Agricultural crops, you need fresh water. Growing microalgae, you end up saving 20% of the world's freshwater supplies. If I understand correctly, what you said to me is that not only uh, will micro, microalgae grow on seawater, but that in the process of harvesting that seawater every day, you actually put a better quality seawater back into the ocean than you took out. Well, you put it in, it, it has no contaminants, it has no herbicides, no pesticides, no nitrogen or phosphorus, because the algae have removed all the nitrogen or phosphorus. So unlike agricultural crops, 
you produce agricultural wastewater, there's no agricultural wastewater from, from algae. Another important thing, you grow them on barren land. All these crops, soybeans, palm oil, sugarcane, maize, you need to grow those on cropland. Algae can be grown on the desert, barren land, land that is used for nothing right now. And if you grow all of this on barren land, that means that all the land that is being converted into these other crops can be returned to forest, which is also benefiting the planet. Right. Right now, you, you're growing <clears throat> on roughly three million square kilometers. That's roughly uh, half the size of Southeast Asia. <clears throat> Uh, you're growing those crops. That, all that land could get returned to forest by growing algae on desert land. And we know that creating those, those farms that are growing, like the palm oil, for instance, we live in Asia here, so we know that growing that palm oil, deforesting those plants, burning off the, the, the peat underneath so that they could plant the palm oil, um, was one of the great, greatest pollutants in Southeast Asia of the last few years, which of course dissipates and pollutes the entire planet. That's right. So you could actually turn that around, go back to forests, and grow a plant that grows and doubles in size every day. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's endless possibilities. There are. <laughs> and I know also you told us that there's an unbelievable number of species of algae. Well, it's true. They're about, they're estimated to be about 100,000 species of algae. And out of those, we only have about 3,000 in captivity. There's 97,000 that we haven't even got in, in a study. test tube somewhere. Yeah. And uh, so the, the, the possibilities are enormous. I mean, we know most of the plants on the planet. We've discovered most of them. But the algae, we haven't. So um, to produce the algae on a large scale, you have essentially two systems, a photobioreactor system, which is a closed system. These are modular. They, each one takes about the, as much water as a swimming pool. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and those double, in, in those systems, you're doubling the algae every day. But that's seawater. That's seawater. And those are closed systems. So. That means closed to, to the atmosphere. Yes. So that other contaminants are not able to get in. The air is filtered. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and those we've all, you know, we've already we're, we're producing with with those systems now. Mm -hmm. Then from the photobioreactor, you harvest every day half, and that half of the harvest goes into an open pond, an open pond which is then filled with seawater and the inoculum of algae. And then two days later, you harvest the open pond completely. And it's already quadrupled in the amount of biomass. Quadrupled. Quadrupled in two days. So you start in the morning of day one and you end up in the afternoon of day two and now you harvest the whole crop. And you do that year round. 365 days a year. Yeah. You basically harvest a crop every day. Every day, yeah. And from that crop, you can extract oil, fish food, vitamins. Yeah, algae make the same products that all plants make. They make protein, carbohydrates, and oils. And it, to separate them, you use the same sort of techniques that you use for soybeans, for example. So, for example, to extract oil, you do a hexane extraction. You extract that in hexane and then you're able to separate the oil from the proteins and the carbohydrates <clears throat> and process the oil however you wish. You can make it into uh, the nutritional fatty acids, the omega-3s, you can make it into vegetable oil, or you can make it into biofuel. Uh, with the protein, you can make milk products, you can make yogurt, you can make animal feed protein. There's any number of products that you can make. That's unbelievable. Yeah. One big thing about the profitability of algae is that most of the algae is produced now in first world countries uh, and countries that are relatively cold. So Japan, the United States, and Europe. Um, and that's why it's costly. If you 
bring it to the third world countries to develop it basically to the tropics uh, where algae grows year round. I mean, we did it in Hawaii. You did it in Hawaii, but you also did it in Saudi Arabia. Well, we were looking at doing it in Saudi Arabia. Uh -huh. But if you, do it, if you do it in those warm countries, the labor pool is there. It's a lot less expensive and capital costs are less. Anyway, that's, that's, that brings a lot to the algae profitability, is doing it in warm, sunny areas where labor is cheap. And, well, <laughs> I want to say that the average uh, facility already is about one kilometer squared, one square kilometer, and that's the scale that you need to be able to process it efficiently. And how much do you get? If you had one square kilometer of land, what would the production be? Uh, the production would be, let's see, about uh, order uh, about 80 tons per hectare per year. So you'd get uh, 100 times that, 8,000 8, tons. So Mark, how much more efficient is algae than the alternatives? Yeah, it's, put it this way, it's uh, six times more productive than oil palm. That's the thing, it's six yeah. times more, but this growing and algae. And it's 40 times more productive than soybeans. And sugar cane? Sugar cane is about 25 times more productive. So let's, let's, let's just say that as a, as, a, as, a, as a little moment. If we could have one square kilometer of wasteland, preferably in a hot climate, we could produce 8,000 tons of algae. It would use only seawater. It would provide jobs. It would have no chemical waste residue, no bad residue whatsoever. And it could be up and running inside of a year or so and not require any serious permitting or anything. So it's like a dream for an investor. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And uh, given what algae are capable of, uh, we know that the productivity could be doubled. Wow, the productivity could be doubled. So the more, uh, the more that there's re research done, this the more we'll be able to, uh, the producers will be able to increase the productivity from already doubling per day. Yeah, we, we know the 8,000 ton value is from what has already been done at large scale in the field. Mm -hmm. um, the 15,000 ton level has been achieved in the lab. Ah, the 15,000 ton level has been achieved in a lab, but it has not yet been done, actually achieved in, in, in industrial production. Without genetic modification. I don't know very much, but that just sounds very profitable to me. Mm -hmm. and, and most of the labor is actually farm labor. It's farm labor. And we're looking at, to produce all the biofuel on the planet, we need about 20 million jobs. That's 20 million jobs in tropical countries. 20 million jobs where that's tax receipts, payroll tax receipts for governments of, of poor countries, developing countries. Well, it's more than tax receipts. When you have 20 million people working, you have 20 million people supporting an economy. As technology reduces the, the workforce in certain industries, this is a way to create a workforce in an in industry that at the same time is having a positive impact and changing the health effects of the whole planet. Mm -hmm. This is not like working in a, in a refinery. This is a a really healthy work environment. In fact, most of those laborers are walking most of the eight hour day. They're walking down the ponds, they're harvesting ponds, they're, they're working outdoors. Um, there's, it's, it's a beneficial for human exercise. Some of our fellow citizens who happen to be blessed with lots of money could actually create businesses that benefit the planet and benefit the people on the planet by providing jobs and benefit all humanity by providing something that's healthy and sustainable and that's a positive story all around. And to come back to the carbon emissions, to cut out the carbon emissions from the fossil fuels that it replaces. So microalgae would be replacing five billion tons of fossil fuel emissions and secondly, growing all these things on barren land instead of the cropland, that means the cropland gets reforested and the reforestation takes up another 8 billion tons of CO2. So it now begins to take CO2 out of the atmosphere. And if you were speaking to industrial leaders, 
And if you were speaking to political leaders, the people who make the big decisions, because we need the help of the big decisions, it's great if all of us help, if all of us do our part, then we're working towards making a better world. This is important. But real change happens when industrial leaders and, and political leaders join in. What do you want to say to them? Well, I want to say, first of all, wake up. The world is changing really fast. I mean, electricity prices just within the last two years have, have gone now renewables in favor. Wake up to the information that's at hand. Get more in tune with what's economical, what's cost effective. What's cost effective is reversing climate change. That's the most cost effective uh, thing you can do. There's a, a lot more jobs in the new Green Deal than there is in the old uh, fossil fuel deal. There's a lot more jobs. Um, yeah, this is, this is where the profit's to be made. It's in the, it's in the new renewables. It's in uh, everything that we've been talking about. You know, I'm thinking that um, it's always difficult for people to change. Yeah. We deal with that every day, whatever yeah. kind of change you want to do. Change is very difficult for people. People become habituated, people right. come used to things. And it's also very difficult for people who are, uh, to feel that they're um, losing their status. Status is also very important for human beings. It, it probably shouldn't be from a philosophical perspective. You want to say that's nonsense, but, but that's the fact. So these large industrialists don't have to lose their place. They just have to change what they're making their money with. Yeah. You know, I mean, if oil is going down and it's inevitable that it will go down and it's being replaced, then why aren't these people building some of these plants. I really want to suggest that our, that our leaders, our, our thought leaders and our industrial leaders actually start to make better choices and invest their money in, in renewables, in sustainability, and, and realize that now it is profitable. Before it was a charity, before it was an experiment, before it was a nice to do, to look good, but now it's actually, it's profitable. It's the right thing to do and you can make money doing it. I can't thank you enough for sharing all this with us today. I think that's really incredible. And I know now you're about to go off on a tour that you're starting here, you're leaving, you've been living here on Koh Samui for the last while and now you're about to make your tour and go and spread your message around the world and get your book published. And I want to thank you very much from all of us at Kamalaya. And I want to wish you really good luck. Please spread your message. We will do our best to spread the message and we'll do whatever we can do. And um, I, I wish you Godspeed. Thank you so much.